Good day, two wheel friends. Zach Kors here with Revzilla, and welcome to another episode of Daily Rider. The motorcycle we're going to learn about today as we ride is none other than Suzuki's GSX-8S. That is an all new engine from Suzuki, approximately 800cc parallel twin, and it's wrapped up in a new package and platform. Weighs just under 450 pounds and costs about $9,000. So as with any all new model, there are lots of questions swirling around. In this case specifically, is there room in Suzuki's lineup for this bike? Bigger than that, is there room for another mid-sized naked bike in the world of motorcycling? What with all the other models around throwing punches? Some of these questions are harder to answer than others, if I'm being honest. The good news is I got a ride to work anyway. So uh, why don't we take a spin and we'll talk about it. All right. Alrighty, everybody, before we get going, as usual, just a friendly reminder that this episode of Daily Rider is brought to you by our friends at Rever. Rever is a mobile app that allows you to plan and track your ride and then share photos and that ride information with your friends and an online riding community. You can download it at your app store of choice or to learn more, go to rever.co. Alrighty, everybody, Suzuki GSX 8S. Oh, my leg hurts. I uh, pulled a muscle in my leg riding dirt bikes with Ari Henning. We're up to 30, 35 years now of riding dirt bikes together and watching the other person hurt their leg. <laughs> um, I'm moving a little slow today, but we're still gonna talk about this GSX 8S. All right, let's uh, start with the engine, shall we? 776 cc parallel twin. This is a 270 crank, so sometimes I talk about how the, the 180 crank pistons go like this, 270 crank, they go like this kind of, 90 degree crank pin offset uh, offers character similar to a 90 degree V-twin, which of course speaks to Suzuki's history, what with the SV650 and SV1000, that kind of thing. And yeah, a few other pieces of tech in there that uh, we'll talk about when we talk about the engine. Got this underslung exhaust. Other than that, pretty basic frame architecture. I kind of like the um, trellis subframe thing in my jig there. Yeah, braking components, the 310 mil discs, rubber brake lines, basic tire sizes, basic motorcycle sizes, basic everything size. <laughs> Not to say that's the basic bike. It's got some character that we'll uh, explore when we ride. Not least of which this front end here. The headlights are very unique, I think, and uh, also these big kind of teeth or uh, mandibles, I don't know, stick out here, <laughs> kind of insect-like. Yeah, what else? Any other things I need to... Oh, there's a couple little weird things. Check out the uh, tail section here. See, there's no tail light in the actual tail section. The tail light's actually on this big cantilevered fender thingy, which is going to make fender eliminator kits a little trickier, I would imagine, though that's not something I've done a lot of research on, <laughs> to be clear. Just shooting from the hip there. Basic as it might be, actually the dash is pretty, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, high tech, but state of the art anyway. A TFT here that's big and bright and we'll talk more about that. And as usual with Suzuki, you get the uh, single push start, which is handy if you think that kind of thing is cool. And there you have it, that new engine sound. Does it sound like anything you've heard before? Probably. Uh, like I said, in the same vein as, uh, you know, Yamaha MT-07, Honda Africa Twin, Triumph Speed Twin, something like that, similar architecture and design, which is why it sounds thumpy and similar. All right, I think we're good to go here. This is really dirty now that I'm looking at it. <laughs> I'm paying attention. Sorry about that, Suzuki. Oh, yeah, it's in the matte black. The black just shows dirt. Everybody knows that. Uh, I do think it looks very sharp in the white and or blue colorways as well, for what it's worth. Oh, that leg is not feeling so hot. Ugh. Alrighty, uh, foot up on the foot peg, a little more comfortable. Okie doke everybody, let's ride to work, shall we? Alright, we can talk about some specs right off the bat here. Like I said, just about $9,000 for this bike. 8850, I believe, is the MSRP, which makes it actually a little bit cheaper than that uh, Z650 RS that we rode recently. That's top of mind, which is why I bring it up. With the 3.7 gallon gas tank all the way full, uh, it tipped the scales at 444 pounds on the daily rider scales. And the seat height is a Pretty approachable 31.9 inches. And you can see I got a pretty good bend in my leg there. If anything, I think it feels lower than that. Could be because I weigh 200 pounds and the suspension is a little soft in general, but especially for someone my size. So that probably helps the <laughs> laden seat height go down a little bit. As for horsepowers, 
the claimed horsepower, I believe, is 82 horsepower, something like that. And I haven't seen a whole lot of dyno information yet on this bike, but I'm sure that if you are particularly interested, you could Google it and find out exactly what the sucker puts to the rear wheel. But yeah, sort of a uh, basic horsepower figure. Not trying to set the world on fire with the amount of ponies on tap, this bike. And we'll talk more later about the engine dynamic and how it speaks to Suzuki's goals. <laughs> but first we're going to wait for this train, like you do. All right, where were we before we were talking about trains and red lights and stuff? We should be talking about ergonomics. That's what we should be talking about. And I really like the way that the 8S feels sitting on it. It's a really nice blend of compact. It's pretty small, like the seat to foot peg distance is short enough to feel sporty. The handlebar is pretty close to the seat. So you feel, I don't know, it feels like it's gonna fit a lot of different sizes of people. At six foot two, I'm plenty comfortable, but I think it's gonna fit lots of other people who are a little bit taller and quite a bit shorter as well, which I uh, appreciate, I like that about it. You know what vibe it gives me actually is KTM 890 Duke. That was kind of the first thing I thought of when I sat on it, I was like, ah. Oh, it reminds me of an 890 Duke. Uh, and it's been probably six or eight months since I rode an 890 Duke. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But that was kind of the first thing that struck me. The bike's character in general isn't wholly dissimilar from a, from a KTM Duke either. Which, again, I'd like to talk about later. Don't let me forget. As we roll on to the highway here, we are in fourth gear. As you can see, 35 miles an hour, about 3,000 RPM. I'm going to try not to get plastered by a semi-truck. But what I'd like to talk about is roll on power a little bit, specifically because this engine is quite good at this kind of thing. Rolling on the power in the middle of the rev range here. Just really, really smooth, super nice. Plenty of punch, not overwhelming. It eventually kind of signs off once you spin it up to, I don't know, seven, eight, something like that. It revs to just under 10, I think, before the rev limiter kicks in. It's a very, very satisfying engine to use between two and 5,000 RPM, which of course, in this scenario, not the freeway specifically, but riding to work is exactly what you want. And I appreciate that Suzuki focused on that. Anyway, more to the point, how's the wind protection, Zach? Yeah, 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 you know how the wind protection is. We don't need to talk about that. I will say, I at least appreciate the riding position again, though. I like how it feels on the open road, even with 70 miles an hour wind hitting you in the chest. It's just kind of like a comfortable, commanding position to be in. I appreciate it. However, the seat is not that great. It's kind of thin. If I had to guess, it's thin to make it below 32 inches on the spec chart and relatively approachable, which it is, but I wish it had another five, 10 millimeters of padding <laughs> and seat height. And granted, it's easy for me to say, right? Six foot two. Sure, of course you want the bike to be taller, Zach, no big deal. But I just feel like the person that's interested in this bike also wouldn't necessarily be intimidated by or thrown off by a slightly taller seat and one that was a little more comfortable and didn't start to hurt your buns after, I don't know, hour and a half or so. <laughs> so what else here? The seat's not great, riding position is great, but there's a few other things that are gonna suggest that this bike isn't awesome for, you know, long road trips or long freeway travel. One of them is the fuel tank size, 3.7 gallons, which even getting 50 to 55 miles a gallon as I did, uh, doesn't have a ton of legs. And then there's the stuff, you know, there's no cruise control. There's no sort of like amenities that suggest that this bike is for doing that kind of thing. And the last thing that's gonna suggest that this bike isn't great for road trips is me. I'm gonna tell you, it's just not really a travel machine. Suzuki, if no one else will tell you, <laughs> they've got a V-Strom 800 with the same engine and a windscreen and a bigger gas tank. And that's the bike Suzuki would probably recommend you take on a road trip. All that being said, I mean, you can take a Honda CT90 across Alaska if you want to. You can ride a Yamaha R6 from LA to New York if you want to. Any bike will take a road trip. You'll just be less comfortable than you would be on something that was slightly more appropriate. And that's the only thing I'm bringing up about the, the 8S's long leg potential. One other thing I want to talk about was the smoothness of this engine, which is very smooth. <laughs> It's great, especially the 4,500, 5,000 RPM. And we're from 65 to about 70, 75, 72, something like that. Pretty smooth, like it. If you go, um, say, 6,000 RPM, which I think is about what you're pulling in sixth gear, going maybe 80, 
you start to get a pretty notable buzz in the handlebar and in the foot pegs, which is surprising considering it's an all new engine and there are two counterbalancers in there and it's supposed to be the latest and greatest version of what this type of engine can be. And it maybe doesn't feel quite like that, but you're not gonna be uncomfortable in any scenario, I don't think. Plus I just told you not to take it on a road trip. So, you know. <laughs> Last thing we usually talk about here is mirrors, and I like these mirrors. Good shape, good position, a little vibey if the engine's up at, uh, you know, 6,000 RPM or so. But in general, pretty good mirrors, pretty practical, pretty good. All right, moseying into our round town segment behind a line of cars, as is typical. Oop, I got a little herk and jerk on the throttle there. Wasn't paying attention. Classic issue with a modern fuel injected bike. The fueling in general is pretty good on this bike. I like it. It just does that that sort of typical on off bobble herk jerk thing that just about every motorcycle does. I haven't experimented much with footless stops. There we go. We got one. But uh, considering my leg hurts, this is valuable research for me to be doing. <laughs> so it's uh, especially pertinent, unfortunately. All right, here we go. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. I wasn't necessarily expect the 8S to be particularly good at footless stops, but realistically, like I said, nice commanding riding position and not too much weight and pretty good clutch feel. So yeah, I guess maybe I shouldn't be too surprised or maybe it's just my, oh no, I had to put my foot down. And it was my bad foot. Uh, come on, little guy. Ugh. A little herk and jerk from the quick shifter there too. Did you notice that? That's something I don't love about this bike. The quick shifter is not very good. I mean, it's fine, especially I would say the upper part of the gearbox where the ratio is a little closer to each other, it works a little bit better and it works especially well at low RPM, in my opinion, which is where the engine thrives anyway. Higher RPM, especially downshifts are not particularly good. And sometimes, yeah, that first to second gear shift is just a little bit blah, blah, blah. There are times, about 30, 40% of the time, where it feels exactly like every quick shifter should. Just perfect. And the rest of the time, I question if Suzuki spent enough time on the refinement of it. Especially downshifts. Let's see if we can get it to do a downshift here. So if we go a little higher and you press down, yeah, especially high RPM downshifts. There's just not enough blip from the auto blip. <laughs> I was wondering if it even had a auto blip down when I first wrote it. Maybe it doesn't. I'm just jamming the gearbox from one side to the other. I don't know. Alright, we got enough time to talk about the dash here? I think we might. I like this dash a lot. It's really crisp, easy to see, easy to read, and sensible to use. It's nice and easy to use. Over here you got a mode, where is it? There you go. Mode button, which will take you up to toggle through TC. Three modes of TC which are not different enough from each other, if you ask me, and you can shut it off. And then three ride modes, A, B, and C. C is uh, comfort. A is, I forget what they call it, attack, aggressive. I don't know, something kind of silly. <laughs> yeah, is the more aggressive one that I think is too aggressive. I like B mode, personally. And then, uh, how do we get to, yeah, and then you can cycle through this information on the bottom of the dash here. Trip one, uh, average fuel, trip two, range, 125 miles of range here. And then, let's see, you can hold down and jump into another menu, I think. Where is it? Hold up, there we go. Uh, and then you can go to, you know, you can tune the quick shifter, shift light, these other settings here, which uh, is, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. It all like, it works really well. It's not exciting or, you know, thrilling to use, but it's very clean, very clear, and I really appreciate it. Yep, green light. There we go. We have enough time to talk about the dash. I like that. And away we go, Jixus 8S. <laughs> really punchy engine. Really like the engine. It's good. Last of the stop sign challenges here. I've been impressed with the stop sign. I thought the, the 8S did quite well. There we go. There's another one. And it's just like real good at chugging away from a stop like that also. It's very happy the engine down there. I like it. Speaking of round town, I think that the passenger accommodations, now that we're on Lover's Lane here, could best be summed up as round town accommodations. The passenger seat's kind of thin, 
the foot pegs for the passenger are kind of high. It's not like full on sport bike aggressive, but it's pretty close. And it's not hugely surprising for this bike, right? It's not all about passenger accommodations. If you're gonna take a passenger, they're not gonna wanna be on there for very long. And I think the passenger pegs unbolt, don't they? I'm pretty sure, which is kinda nice. You can take them off. There's also a little, um, uh, there's a cowl you can get instead of the, the passenger seat. So, you know, if you wanna announce to the world that you're a lone wolf, you can do that too. Right, into the twisty road section. I've been looking forward to this. The 8S is a lot of fun on a twisty road. The suspension is not refined and it's not adjustable particularly, but the, the way the chassis works is good. I really just appreciate the sort of basic setup of it. And again, the riding position works for the freeway, works for twisty roads. I had a lot of fun in my testing for this bike, ripping along twisty roads and you have to ride really aggressively to to actually kind of like bottom out the suspension or or find its limit in any real way it's not high end but it is capable of having a good time and i've had a blast on this bike in any situation where i can sling it from side to side i think it's a wicked platform it's so fun and if you want to take it to uh, your beginner or intermediate track day i think you'd have a hoot on an 8S, absolutely. I think if you're an expert track rider, you'll be a little underwhelmed by the brake bite, by the uh, suspension dynamics, stuff like that. But in general, whew, fun bike, very fun. All right, talking of brakes, I suppose we're approaching this here red light. We can jam down through this gearbox and talk about those brakes. Brakes are good, I like them. I think basically the deal with the brakes is that the componentry is there. They're nice big calipers. They're nice big rotors, sort of like big enough pieces of equipment to do the job. Just none of it is super spicy or high end or expensive or anything like that. It's a basic uh, master cylinder. It's rubber lines. It's basic calipers, but everything's the right size. You know, they arguably could have skimped on putting together the braking system, but uh, it's all decent stuff and it's not a super heavy bike. So it works well. All right, green light. Away we go. <laughs> so the engine that I promised to talk about, it is in some ways, like I said, pretty basic design architecture that's been out and about for a minute here as far as 270 crank parallel twins in the motorcycling world, especially the past decade, there've been more and more of them. This engine, like I said, has a couple of counterbalancers in there to try to smooth it out, which for the most part work pretty well. The basic thing that a lot of these parallel twins are doing that we're seeing so many of them in the, in the motorcycling world is they're reaching for emissions compliance, right? Euro 5 compliance and that kind of thing. And the way that engines are put together that way, the sort of collateral damage of designing an engine to be efficient in that way is actually ends up being sort of like torque rich, mid-range rich, which is a happy accident and good for plenty of brands that are building these engines because they can put it in their brochure that it was designed with city riding in mind and a punchy low range power band or whatever the brochure would say. And this is just sort of another in a long line of those engines that work well in these scenarios. And of course, move the needle, you know, move the ball downfield for Suzuki as far as meeting emissions regs and keeping all the legal beagles happy. As for how it compares to other engines, I mentioned the 90 Duke and um, I think, oh, hey, I think um, this bike definitely reminds me of that. The KTM engines hit a little higher up, I think. They have good mid-range. They feel much stronger as they spin up. This one kind of signs off and those engines really kind of punch pretty hard up there. And I think in some ways this might feel stronger because it has more of its power down low, but I don't think that it would compare particularly favorably in a dyno chart to a KTM 890 engine. <laughs> I think this engine is probably pretty well outclassed. That's speculation, to be fair, uh, or even a 790 engine for that matter. Um, but still, that doesn't make it uh, doesn't make it a bad engine. It's good. One aspect of this engine that I don't love, which I don't even love that I'm saying this, to be honest, but I wish it was a little louder. It's just so muffled. It's so quiet. It's, it reminds me of an MT-07 that way. It just, it has kind of a fun thump to the exhaust note. It just, you don't really hear any of it. It's so muted, which is a shame. But I think that that leaves plenty of potential for appropriate aftermarket options. It's something that'll make it bark a little bit more. I think, I bet it'll sound good with a pipe on it. Just not too loud, okay, everybody? Just, just try to keep it reasonable. 
All right, well, the ride's almost over. It's time to address those questions I posed in the beginning. Is there room for this bike in the world of motorcycling, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there is. I think so. It's, it's, a, it's a fun bike. And I think if I was gonna sum it up um, most swiftly and succinctly, I would say it's a budget KTM 790 or 890 Duke, which I think is a pretty big compliment. And I think that that's a, uh, yeah, it's faster and punchier and uh, feels a little bit more aggressive and capable than uh, an SV650, it's sibling, or a Yamaha MT-07, or a, a Kawasaki Z650, bikes like that. It doesn't offer all the same technology and whiz bangs and doodads as um, a Yamaha MT-09 or a Triumph Street Triple or uh, those KTM Dukes. So I think, yeah, I think it does fit. Um, I just think that Suzuki's gonna need to up its game in one direction or another to start differentiating it and really uh, make make a hole for itself. Perhaps off-road is the, is the niche that Suzuki should go after. What do we think? How do we think this thing's gonna be on a, on a dirt road here? <laughs> Well, we're going to have to take it easy since uh, I'm walking wounded here. Uh, but you can adjust TC on the fly, which I think is kind of cool. You can even shut it off whilst you ride, which I appreciate. So we'll put it in mode one here. Um, and I'll show you what I mean about these TC modes. So this is like basic TC. I mean, it's for, sort of feels middle of the road trash control to me. Like it's it doesn't let you spin up. It's, uh, it's pretty conservative. And this is the most lenient mode that it offers. So you put it in mode three and it's even more conservative, but it's just such a narrow band. Considering settings two and three exist, why not, uh, you know, let me have some, uh, let me have some fun. Like say with it off. <laughs> and has ABS in the dirt. Yeah, pretty good actually. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's rambunctious, man. Very rambunctious. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's a good engine and um, it makes for a very characterful bike absolutely <laughs> not great on a dirt road but not bad so you can shut TC off as I said which means you can huh, come on buddy there we go you can wheelie it and it is a very good wheelie bike look at it go I guess the speedos in the front wheel <laughs> uh, great wheelie bike great engine good enough quick shifter good chassis super fun i'm gonna be sad to give this one back <laughs> i've had a blast with this bike uh. all right last test here can you back it in abs is not particularly adjustable but you can uh <laughs> it didn't really work very well you can um, you know drop it down through the gearbox and let the clutch go and it'll get a little swayzy that's not really its thing though which is sort of a shame come to think of it because um this bike is, I don't know, it's got that kind of, it's got that pizzazz in it, I think. So I'm a little sorry not to see a slightly more rambunctious attitude and nature from the um, designers when it came to adjustable electronics. But, you know, backing it in here and there is not gonna keep me from enjoying this bike. All right, we've only got two parking spaces to do the U-turn here, and I don't like our chances on the Jixus 8S. Close this right here. Full lock left, feet up. Uh, 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 oh, no, that would have been 2.2, uh, two, two and a quarter parking spaces, something like that. Not bad for a bike that's supposed to be good in the city, I reckon. But um, also not notable, <laughs> if we're being honest. Uh, all right, that was fun, everybody. Thanks for coming along, and uh, now we can. Oh, use my my one and a half legs to pull us around here and we can listen to this exhaust pipe that I wish was louder makes a cool noise yeah it's a it's a spicy little mill yeah I just wish it was uh, was a little bit louder does that make me a bad person I really hope not Okay, no, kiddos, time for some Instagram questions here. Uh, first one's from Jacob P. 
Petrisek, who says, do you think Suzuki messed up the price of the bike compared to the Honda Hornet 750? Right now, lots of questions about the Honda Hornet 750 in my Instagram feed. The Hornet 750 is cheaper, a bit faster top end, and offers similar whiz bangs. So the Hornet 750, as of the time of the recording of this video, has not been announced in the United States, so it's not really relevant in my sphere in my market, right? I don't have access to it, and I'm not sure if and when I will. I do think it's a fair point that Jacob brings up here. Jakub, perhaps? I don't know. And I can't speak to that. Sorry, because I haven't ridden the bike. Time will tell, I think. If, you know, Honda sells a kajillion Hornets and, and Suzuki doesn't sell any of these, well then, yeah, obviously they did mess up that price. I wish I could give you a calculated and thoughtful comparison between the two, but I'm afraid I can't. I'm glad you brought it up, though, and I think it's something, depending on the market that you're in, to think about. Next question is from Go For A Rip Canada, who says, is it better than an SV650? I assume it will be, but how much? Is it as good as a GSX-S750? I assume it won't be, but again, how close is it? The reason I save this question is I do think it's better than an SV650 in some sort of uh, uh, appreciable ways. I think it's just sort of like punchier. If you like the styling more than an SV, maybe you'd appreciate that. I personally think an SV looks better, but whatever. The point is it, it's different. And yeah, I mean, the engine's bigger. It's just sort of like faster. It's a little bit more aggressive, I think. So whether or not that's better is kind of up to you. But yeah, in the sort of ways that everyone thinks of that, it's better. The reason I save this question is that I think it's actually better than a GSX-S 750 for me. I don't see what a GSX-S 750 does that this doesn't, aside from have four cylinders. This gets better mileage, probably. I actually don't know what a GSX-S 750 gets off the top of my head, but I bet this gets better mileage. I just like the engine dynamic better, like a full top speed sprint. Yeah, maybe a GSX-S 750 is better, but like, who cares about that? <laughs> I, t I just don't. I just don't care how fast it can go in the last 800 RPM of the rev range. What's important is the, the meat of it. And this bike does that so much better than a Jixxus 750. And I tip my cap to Suzuki for that. Next question is from Feng Zun, who asks, how does it handle the twisties compared to a Duke 890? So we talked about the Duke 890, uh, sorry, 890 Duke and 790 Duke engine specifically. But yeah, as for how, uh, you know, handles the twisties or how the whole package stacks up, to a KTM 890 Duke, say, it's a clear step below. Very clear. The bike in a microcosm, I think, is that quick shifter, right? I rode a KTM 890 Duke on a racetrack last year sometime, and you could bail into corners on the brakes, knee basically on the ground, and like hit that down uh, quick shifter down through the gears, and the bike didn't miss a beat. It was just butter, perfectly smooth, perfectly refined. Very, very, very impressive bike to sling around a racetrack, bone stock. This bike, isn't that. <laughs> it just isn't as refined. It isn't as fancy. It isn't as nice. It isn't as adjustable. It isn't as fast. But the fact that we're having a conversation about it, I think, like I said before, a compliment to Suzuki. Next question is from C. Weaver in 1981, who says, why does it have a nicer display than my GSX-R1000 that costs $5,000 more? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. And I don't have an answer, <laughs> but I do have a quick little anecdote that might not surprise you all. Maybe you already know this, but the way that that often works, the way, the reason that you see certain features on certain bikes has to do with the design and pre-production cycle of a bike. So Suzuki probably started working on this bike years ago, right? And when they did the upcoming state of the art, what they were going to use was this dash. So they included that in the design brief for the bike. And now it has it in production, a bike that seems fancier, but started its design journey sooner when this dash wasn't on the docket for inclusion on the model means that it won't have that. So basically the upshot is that the Jigster 1000 is due for an update and maybe that's the point that you're making. <laughs> and for that, I don't really have an answer. Just cross your fingers, I suppose. Last question, I'm going to do a two shot here. I have two questions that I think kind of speak to the same thing. Ricky Babuna says, will this platform catapult Suzuki to the greatness it achieved with the GSX-R series decades back? Why or why not? And the other question, yeah, scroll to the other end here, is from Corbin Goodwin, who says, does it have enough unique character to set it apart if you were riding it blindfolded? Or is this Suzuki on the bandwagon too late to make a dent? And I think these questions are related to each other, right? Because... The answer to Ricky Babuna's question is no, it won't catapult Suzuki to the greatness because the thing that the GSX-R did that was special was that it was the only one of its kind, right? I mean, yeah, there were Honda VFs and there were Kawasaki GPZs and sport bikes were sort of happening, but the GSX-R really set itself apart as this kind of, wow, holy cow, this is something that we haven't seen before. And that's not what the 8S is. The 8S is a good bike, but to Corbin Goodwin's point, it's getting on the train <laughs> as it leaves the station to my eye. And I think that's an astute comment that we've been expecting this, right? 
from Suzuki and it just took longer than people thought, I think. And I'm both disappointed that it took this long and happy to see that it finally happened because I think it shows the sort of engineering prowess and the sort of fun loving nature of what Suzuki can build when it puts its mind to it. So I appreciate your questions and your comments, Corbin and Ricky on this topic. I think it's a good thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about the Suzuki GSX 8S. Thanks for the ride, everybody. Let's put the sucker on Daily Rider Leaderboard and then I can let you go. All right, see ya. Okay, McDokey, here we are. Inside the chop here at Revzilla West, um, we have a Suzuki GSX 8S uh, in the hopper, ready to go on the 2023 Daily Rider Leaderboard. And I think it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be pretty high up there. It's a pretty good Daily Rider. Hopefully that's not a huge surprise at this point, right? I was uh, ranting and raving about the engine. Uh, chassis is pretty good, as basic and simple as it is. So yeah, we have some pretty pretty good contenders at the top of the leaderboard here. As a friendly reminder, you got your SV650 at the top there, speaking of Suzuki, and then uh, a Kawasaki Z650 RS and a Honda CB500X sort of mid-size adventure bike. So where do we think the 8S falls? I think, um, is it better than a CB500X from Honda? to a smallish uh, adventure bike. Practically, the CB500X is more approachable, it's easier, that kind of thing. But the, the 8S is just, it's more fun, it's more potent, it's a little bit more advanced. Uh, it's not a whole lot more expensive. I mean, it is more expensive, but it's not that bad. Um, so yeah, I think so. Is it better than an SV650? <sighs> hmm, hmm. <laughs> it's punchier and you know like the dash is more uh up to date and that kind of thing so uh but i guess i just feel like the sv it's got the it's got the pedigree the lineage the the sort of uh the aftermarket to support it's got all those parts so many different things you can do with an sv just because it's been around for so long and it's uh it is uh, more affordably priced um and yeah, I don't know. That's very tough. That's very tough. But it is also the SV more approachable. I think it's a little bit calmer and at the same time feels more versatile maybe. So yeah, I'm giving the nod to the Suzuki SV650. Is it better this 8S than a Z650 RS? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, it's on the opposite end of the visual spectrum, that's for sure. <laughs> and it depends what you like, whether you like the, the way the 8S looks or the way the uh, Z650 RS looks, um, but that's where it's gonna go. Uh, doesn't quite dethrone the SV650 at the top of the leaderboard, I don't think, um, but, uh, but here we are, two Suzukis at the top of the leaderboard, and the, the Daily Rider leaderboard from 2022, Jixus 1000 GT Plus in second place over the whole course of the year. We did a whole podcast, the high side, low side, about what's the deal with Suzuki, why aren't they doing anything interesting, why is everything so boring? And, uh, and here we are with, with um, three of the top four motorcycles that we've covered in the past 18 months almost, Suzuki's. Yeah, I'm eating my hat here, I don't know. Um, but uh, anyway, that 8S is a, is, a, is a cool bike. We'll see how it does on showroom floors. I hope um, you all like it, the, the general motorcycling public. <laughs> uh, and of course, I hope you liked this episode of Daily Rider. Thanks for hanging out with me on the ride to work. I hope you had fun, hope you learned something. See you next time, everybody. Hey, everybody, Zach here. Remember me? We just rode to my office together. Yeah, so uh, just a friendly reminder that the way we make these videos here on Revzilla, whether it's um, high side, low side, or CTXP, um, or the shop manual, or daily rider, or first ride reviews, um, is we take money that we make from selling gear to motorcycle enthusiasts such as yourself. So just keep that in mind next time you want to buy a helmet or a jacket or even a, a tent or some chain lube or auxiliary stuff like that. Check out RevZilla.com because the more of your money you spend there, the more money ultimately we have to make programming like this. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I hope you had fun.